prazer hoje receber aqui para dar um seminário para a gente, para dar uma, uma aula magna para a gente, o professor Didley Kaspa, da Universidade de Harvard e também da Texas A&M. Ele é prêmio Nobel de 1986 e nós então damos as boas-vindas ao professor Kaspa e a professora Heloísa Celistri Araújo vai falar algumas palavras sobre a carreira do professor antes dele começar a palestra. É, eu conversei com o professor depois que ele terminar o seminário dele, a gente vai ter um tempo é, é, bastante confortável para fazer perguntas. E, então, por favor, pensem sobre isso. Tá? Professor Luiza. Good morning. Um, I have to switch to English to welcome our guest today. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to have Dr. Dudley Hashback here at Federal University of São Carlos. Uh, just to give you a brief um, view of his uh, scientific contribution, uh, we prepared a few slides just to, uh, to have an idea of his career. Uh, he's a bachelor in mathematics and a master in chemistry and AM in physics and a PhD in chemical physics uh, in Stanford and Harvard universities which are the most famous universities I guess <laughs> and uh, he had several positions but uh, the most uh, uh, not, not the most but one of the <laughs> last ones is the Harvard University He won several prizes and medals. I could not just include here because there are so many. He had about 500 papers, H index of 68, which is very high for those who are familiar to uh, site metrics, and more than 14,000 uh, citations. So th his papers are uh, very well known in the field. But uh, now he's engaged in uh, a very interesting issue. He's engaged in science education and public understanding of science, which is a very interesting subject for us too. And uh, he's very famous for his Nobel Prize uh, for uh, his contributions concerning the dynamics of chemical elementary process. So, uh, Dr. Hershbeck, it's a very pleasure to have you here, and uh, we invite you to, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. My general idea here is to tell some stories. I call them parables, molecular parables. A parable is a story that has an interest and a value beyond the actual subject matter of the story, because somehow it conveys something of more cosmic, enduring, abiding value for a humanistic view of science. I'd like to stress that because uh, so many people think of science as completely a technical thing, I think it's very much a liberal arts thing. It's a humanistic, a cultural thing. And only a longer term do we recognize its contribution in that direction is just as important as the technology that flows from our understanding of nature, uh, which science produces. So what I want to do, as I say, is tell you just some of these stories that illustrate some points. Then I want to make uh, some general remarks about science. Uh, and how, ironically, in universities and uh, even in high school and all, we teach in what I call an anti-science mode. There's some things I like to stress about science that people, the public, the students, naturally get completely wrong impression in my idea, my impression, my idea. Uh, and finally, uh, the most important part of this meeting Uh, I hope there'll be time for 15 or 20 minutes of your questions, because I'd like to respond to your questions. That's most interesting for me. I'm pretty sure it's probably most interesting for you, as too. Uh, so that's the idea I have. 
I might say you gave a very gracious introduction, but there's one thing that is actually the pinnacle of my career. 10 seconds as a guest voice in The Simpsons. Uh, that came about from teaching my freshman chemistry for many years. And little did I know that one of those freshmen was auditioning me for a future voice session on The Simpsons. A student didn't know that either then because they weren't yet connected with The Simpsons. But as a senior, that student became editor of the Harvard Lampoon, the student humor magazine, and was a previous generation of Harvard Lampoon editors that launched The Simpsons. Most people don't realize that connection between Harvard and The Simpsons, but it was destined to happen and it's gone on. All right, so I start with a, my first parable. I call it uh, from uh, propylene to polytoxin. Let's see if I, maybe I'll just press the button here. Uh, the reason I choose this is uh, a favorite saying that my dad often had that I think applies so well to science is the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. And that's something I want to stress when I come after the parable. The polytoxin molecule is a pretty challenging molecule for an organic chemist to synthesize. It has more than 400 atoms. First of all, also it's very, very floppy. And the interest in it is it's probably one of the most poisonous thing uh, that exists. But Professor Kishi, who specialized in synthesizing toxins like that, regarded this as a challenge, like Mount Everest, uh, because only one a particular isomer of uh, a very large number, because there are 72 places in this molecular structure where to get the biologically active form of the molecule, you have to go right or left. You can't do that randomly. You got to do exactly the right turn. So you, it may be, uh, not so bad driving in Brazil as it is in Boston, but it's impossible to imagine anybody driving and getting 72 successive turns correct in Boston. It's not possible. But it, most people thought it's completely impossible in this molecule because to do what's called stereospecific synthesis, that is getting the right spatial orientation of all the parts of the molecule correct in your synthesis, usually uh, has required to have some ring structures in the molecule that gave reference points for where you build a structure that is relative to this ring that you know. This is a very floppy molecule. Almost all the bonds linking successive carbons are single bonds that they can be rearranged. And so you don't have that kind of uh, pre-orientation provided by big ring structures that existed in vitamin B12, for example, another one of the famous syntheses that was accomplished at Harvard. So it was a great shock to organic chemists when Professor Kishi succeeded in synthesizing just the one biologically active form of this molecule. How did he do it? Well, anybody have suggestions? It's a, it does example, exemplify very well the idea, this looks impossible. Five times 10 to the 21 is what you get if you raise two to the 72nd uh, power, which is, of course is the probability of getting it right. <laughs> when you, uh, there are two ways to get it wrong the first time, four ways the second time. Eight, 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 the third, and so forth. That would multiply is a very big number. Uh, so how did he get the right out of 5 times 10 to the 21, which is a huge, huge number? Well, here's the beautiful thing. Uh, he got it right by knowing something about a very small molecule with only three carbons, uh, and that's propylene. So that's why I speak about going from propylene to polytoxin. And here I took a, a, a photograph of my colleague, uh, Kishi. Uh, in his left hand, he has a molecular model of propylene, which we'll look at a little more carefully in a moment. And uh, sorry, that's his right hand. Uh, in his left hand, I 
uh, put 25 grams of sugar because if he were to make one of each of these possible uh, 5 times 21 forms, all different, because at least at one place it's wrong, uh, if you were to make that, it would weigh about 25 grams. So, so just imagine only one molecule within the pile there of 25 grams of molecule is the one he wants to make. How do you do it? Well, he recognized that by knowing this little information about propylene, you see propylene, forget the methyl group for a moment, CHH, uh, ethylene would be two carbons linked with a double bond, and then in ethylene itself, you'd have just hydrogens there at the ends, and that's all in a plane. Uh, attach a methyl group in place to one of the hydrogens, here we are, that makes it propylene to have three carbon atoms. And the question of interest is, does one of the hydrogens eclipse the double bond? That is, is it in the same plane as the other uh, atoms in the molecule? Uh, or uh, would it be rotated in such a way that it avoids it? And the two of the hydrogen atoms, one above and one below, uh, uh, above and the other below are uh, the plane, uh, are on this side or are they on that side? Now you might say, well, what does that matter? I mean, just a little detail of structure. Well, uh, I like the story very much because it was a little project that uh, as a graduate student, my office mate, Larry Kreischer, and I uh, answered that question in one night of work <laughs> because we were then doing microwave spectroscopy of molecules for our PhD work with Professor Bright Wilson in chemistry at Harvard. And uh, microwave spectroscopy is a very, very fine way to study molecular structure in the gas phase. Uh, because as the molecules tumble in space, they're rotating, the spacing between the rotational energy levels is in the microwave region. And you get very high resolution. So every molecule, you have a, a perfect fingerprint. There are hundreds and hundreds of lines you can look at that are unique to that molecule because of the very high resolution of microwave spectroscopy and the rotational spacings of, that are particular to that molecule. Now in the case of uh, propylene, this methyl group uh, can rotate around the axis between the methyl carbon and the nearest one attached to the double bond, and therefore it has different configurations. And one, uh, well, uh, there'll actually three different configurations uh, which will correspond to stable configurations of the methyl group where it'll just torsionally oscillate, uh, and then uh, it actually can tunnel through a barrier between those two minima, really three minima all told. And that's what was so interesting about doing that work, how it affected the spectrum and how we could determine the barrier for going from one minimum to another. So that's how we got interested in finding this out. Well, you can guess how you might find this out. All we need to do is put a deuterium, one deuterium on the methyl group, and that will alter the moment's inertia and therefore the rotational energies of the molecule just enough so we easily can see that in the microwave spectrum. So the next uh, slide shows if we look along the axis from the carbon on the methyl group to its nearest carbon, we can put a little circle there, and you can see beyond that the double bond sticking out here, uh, the hydrogen in the plane of the ethylene part of the molecule. And you can have this configuration as one of the stable ones. This one, which would have hydrogens on either side of the double bond, uh, or something in between. But we could calculate from the known structure of the propylene molecule without any deuterium, uh, we could calculate what should happen if you attach the deuterium. And you see, uh, for this form of it, we should get two structures. The symmetric one would have the deuterium here. If the deuterium is over there or over there, you get two, uh, we call asymmetric isomers. Uh, so we should see both of these, because of course we could have both forms of the uh, molecule. And uh, if this is the structure with the hydrogen eclipsing the 
double bond. Or we should th see these two over here, if this is it, or something in between, if the most stable configuration was this way. Well, it only took us a half hour to attach the deuterium. A very simple synthesis using LL bromide and dripping uh, D2O with some zinc catalyst. And then we had a spectrometer, and in a very short time, we found this spacing, the, 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 the transition for identified these levels. We had several other transitions to check it. Also, when you turn on electric field, uh, something called a Stark effect happens. The lines split up because the uh, asymmetric distribution of electrons gives you what's called a dipole moment that interacts with the electric field in a way that's unique. And so we have total proof, rigorous proof. So we published that little thing in a note. Little did we anticipate that 30 years later, 30 years later, when I went to hear a talk by Kishi on the synthesis of palatoxin that had created a sensation, the first reference was to our paper. We had no idea this would ever be of any real value in chemistry. Mm -hmm.